morning. If I could please have your attention, we're about ready to start our program. I'm Mike Worth, Dean of the College of Communication and Information, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last uh, event of UT Social Media Week, uh, which is the Paul Feinbaum keynote. Um, and before I introduce our keynote speaker, I wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, all of the members of the Social Media Week committee. Uh, headed up by, uh, the committee is headed up by Courtney Childers. Let's give Courtney a separate round of applause for her great work. <laughs> <laughs> Other members of the committee, and please hold your applause till I go through them all. Nick Geidner, Sharon Tatey, Donna Sylvie, Megan Fields, John McNair, Patrick Powell, Karen Robinette, and Susie Allard. Let's give them a, a big round of applause as well. It's, it's been a great week here uh, with all the great guests that we've had, some of whom are still in the room. Uh, with us for this luncheon, but uh, the speaker that we have uh, coming up for the keynote is really exceptional. Uh, Paul Von Pi Feinbaum has been called the voice of the SEC, one of the most powerful people in sports media, the king of the South, and the Oprah Winfrey of college football. <laughs> he has also received the University of Tennessee Accomplished Alumnus Award. Uh, Paul graduated with a degree in political science in 1978. He considered the leading, he's considered the leading sports authority in the South. He joined SPN in 2013. He does a regional radio show from Charlotte, North Carolina, and appears on a variety of other ESPN shows and outlets, including Sports Center, College Football Live, College Game Day, and ESPN the Magazine. In August 2014, when ESPN's SEC network launches, a television simulcast of Feinbaum's radio show will anchor the network's afternoon lineup. Prior to joining ESPN, he served as host of the Paul Feinbaum Radio Network, which was syndicated on stations throughout the South, including Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Tennessee, and he was heard nationally on Sirius XM Radio. Paul's work has earned him more than 250 national, regional, and local sports writing awards, including being named one of Sports Illustrated's most powerful people in sports media in 2013, one of the Tennessean's top SEC power brokers in 2002, and one of the Orlando Sentinel's 10 most powerful people in the SEC in 2009. Paul has been profiled in publications such as The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, and the book Great Call, Why the Feinbaum Show is America's Barbershop, The Wall Street Journal, and the book Great... I'm sorry, I just did that. He also has written two books, The Worst of Paul Feinbaum and Feinbaum Said, and is currently working on a book about his career for HarperCollins Publishers. Without further ado, I give you Paul Feinbaum. He's going to talk about social media's influence on the impartial voice of the SEC. Paul? Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here and just keep eating. Don't mind me. I'm, uh, I will not interrupt your lunch. Um, usually when a professional broadcaster is asked to speak, you hear an opening line that goes something like, well, on the plane down here last night, I, I gave a lot of thought to what I would be saying here. It's done for two reasons. First, to give the audience the impression the speaker has at least thought of the address which most of the time they have not. And secondly, it, and most important, it's to give the impression to the audience that those of us who occasionally do this are so busy that we haven't really had time to work on the lecture, that we are all very important people. Not in my case. I've been thinking uh, about what I would say here today for a little more than 30 years. You've heard, you've heard the saying, the invitation was lost in the mail. In my case, it never got to the mailbox. <laughs> when I spoke earlier today in a classroom, it was the first time I've been in a UT classroom since I graduated. So I deeply appreciate the, the University of Tennessee my alma mater to invite me here today because uh, I think the wait's been worth it. 
When I was a student, you ever heard that line before in a class? <laughs> Back then, when I was a student, social media had not been invented. But the advent of social media has changed everything we do, especially in journalism. When I started doing a talk show 25 years ago, we read newspapers and watched CNN and ESPN. Then, after Al Gore invented the internet, <laughs> we started combing message boards, texts, and whatever else we could get our hand on, our hands on. Now we watch Twitter to see, most important, who will win a seat at this luncheon. Obviously, these two won and lost their seat. But the challenge really is, in social media, knowing what to believe and how to disseminate the information. You've heard a lot this week, and I'm, I'm not looking to recount all the stories that have been told by professionals who, are, who, who, who swim in this big pond. But whenever something happens on our program, or, or in and around our program on Twitter or in some other social media, I try to caution the people that I work around to be careful. Just because it's on social media doesn't mean it's true. And I cannot tell you how many stories we've gotten burned on adversely that were true. A year and a half ago, I saw something on Twitter that the star player at Notre Dame, Manti Teo, was dating an imaginary girlfriend. And I said, there's no way that could be true. <laughs> so I told our guys, hold on. There, this, this is coming from Deadspin. It's not exactly the New York Times. So how could it be true? It was. But the problem is that we all want to rush out there and, and, and put our name on something. And when I was a reporter, uh, when, when, I, when I learned this business, having an exclusive, I saw in the uh, Daily Beacon today, uh, your editor-in-chief, RJ, had an exclusive with Paul Feinbaum, like someone else was trying to get an interview. Uh, <laughs> RJ, I hope you improve on that in your, as you matriculate through life, that you could get big, bigger exclusives than some guy who had never been back to campus to speak before. Hey, good, I, and I love it. I mean, I'll, I will hang in my house and, until the day I die, which is... <laughs> but my point is, uh, an exclusive is, is, is somewhat short-lived on Twitter, like maybe 15 seconds before someone else takes ownership and steals it. And, and the, uh, the most important thing about, about social media is you cannot, and you already know this, and I know you've already heard this, but everyone thinks you can undo something. Remember last year, Johnny Manziel, tweeted that he hated his school because he got a traffic ticket. He, so, I mean, I'm not saying Manziel is a genius. <laughs> but what did he do? He immediately went on Twitter and deleted it like we hadn't already captured it. Yeah. <laughs> so, my point is, think for just a second. And, and I always think for one second before I tweet something. I, I read it back and then read it again, and then it's like, it's a compulsion. You know, I mean, why, why does anyone tweet anything, frankly? Because you have to, I mean, it's like, your, your hand's shaking. Um, <laughs> it's fascinating, though, and I'd love to be able to tell you that those of us who, who grew up in the newspaper business, you know, think that there's a better way, but there isn't. Uh, there's not a journalist in the country who's not glued to it, there's not, uh, a talk show host who doesn't read it. There's, it, is, it has become the most amazing, influential force I've ever seen. And I thought I'd seen it all. Um, but I was at a game a year or two ago in the press box. And there was not one person on my row in the press box watching the game. What do you think they were watching? They were watching what everyone else was saying about the game that they were supposed to be watching. I found myself in an interesting situation 14 months ago. After this long career in Alabama, I woke up on a Tuesday morning unemployed. 
I had not been fired, although that was how the narrative seemed to be going. I just didn't go into work that day because my contract ran out on a Monday. It rarely happens, but it ran out on a Monday on, on Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. I went to work that day, I signed off, and didn't go back in. How did I learn that I was suddenly unemployed? On Twitter. Um, <laughs> Clay Travis, who's a big fan of the University of Tennessee, he reported on his blog that I had left my employer and had signed a contract with a rival radio station. Long-term deal, all kinds of incentives. What was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to respond to that? I'd been told by 15 lawyers, you cannot talk. Why? I had a three-month clause in my contract, which, I, which it was not a non-compete, it, it was a match. So if I had talked to another company, then the company I'd worked for could match it. Guess what? I didn't want to be there any longer, although we're still in partnership now. Um, <laughs> So I literally, uh, I asked one of these lawyers, I said, so, so what can I do? I mean, everybody's reporting I'm doing this. Uh, the local TV station reported I'd gotten fired. Uh, somebody else is saying, he said, go to, oh, do you have an attic in your house? I said, yes. He said, go to the attic and don't come out for three months. <laughs> don't talk to anyone. And, and this was so hard for me. I mean, I'm a communicator. That's what I do. And I, I literally sat up there for three months and didn't talk to anyone. Um, you know how difficult it is to sit at home and read about yourself? And the first month it was interesting because people were speculating where I would go. The second month, people had lost interest. And by the third month, as we were getting up to the date, it was uh, the third week in April last year, people began writing, the guy's washed up, he's finished, he's a nobody. And I'm like going, uh, your Twitter followers are bailing on you and you cannot do a single thing. I mean, I would occasionally tweet something anonymous, but there was, there was no way I could do much. One day during this, Sports Illustrated, uh, the dean referred to it a minute ago, came out with this list. It was obviously done on the previous year, and came out with the 20 most influential people in sports media. I was number 16. To put it mildly, I was thrilled. I mean, how like somebody remembered my name. So, I mean, I, I took a break from watching Judge Judy and Dr. <laughs> Phil. I put down the ironing board, turned down the stove where I was making dinner. And when my wife walked in from work, I ran to the door. I said, you're not going to believe this. Sports Illustrated has me in the top 20 most influential sports journalists sports media people in the country. And she looked at me and said, that's great. Do you realize you're the only person on that list who currently is unemployed? <laughs> well, a couple of good things were happening, though. Don't, don't, don't throw a pity party for me just yet. In the uh, second month of my hiatus, uh, I went to New York, and you heard uh, the dean reference this uh, article in the New Yorker magazine. They had done this big piece on me. And the next day, some activity. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be known in Alabama. It's one thing to be known in Tennessee. But if you're in New York, or any of you from New York, I don't know if any of you even have ever read the New Yorker magazine. But it, in about, on about three blocks in Manhattan, the New Yorker magazine rules. Nowhere else in the world. But on these three blocks, it matters. And the three blocks are the journalism in the literary world. Well, because of this one article, not because of anything I, I've ever done in my life, but because of this one article, which was a 5,000 word piece on my career, don't. I started hearing from book publishers. Well, that's a great story. I went to, I mean, I went to meet this guy, and I don't think he really even knew where I worked, but he said, this is a great book, great book, great book. So we, had, we finally sold this book uh, to Harper Collins. It was an amazing experience. Uh, and I uh, ended up choosing Gene Wojciechowski, who's preceded me here at this campus as a dis an accomplished alumni award, which he reminded me of every week this year during game day that he had been here for. <laughs> and uh, so then the next shoe dropped. Finally, on April 21st last year, I was able to entertain offers. 
And it's like, please, phone ring? I mean, I'm, so I got a couple offers early in the day from the same place that had supposedly just fired me. And late in the day, ESPN came in. And I thought, okay, this is great. We'll just drag this out for a couple of weeks. And I was quickly told that at ESPN, they make you an offer. They're not going to really let you sit on that for a while. Two days later, I accepted at ESPN. Um, and I was thrilled. I, I'd finally gotten this dream job. On April 23rd, I get hired by ESPN. Well, guess what happened? People like Gracie told me I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> Actually, it was Gracie's boss, who's not nearly as kind as Gracie. <laughs> or as under, she called me and said, you cannot say a word, you will, you will not say a word, and we will tell you when you, can say a word. when you can say a word. Well, guess what? Another five weeks went by. A couple of things happened. Uh, unfortunately, it, it was around the time of the Boston Marathon uh, bombing, which pushed everything back with the SEC network and then other things. So finally, it was determined, uh, can I say all this about, it was determined that the Wall, St the Wall Street Journal was going to break the story. And then, I mean, because it had only been three months and another five weeks, people started figuring out that maybe I was, I was either going to get a job or I was going to be perennial unemployed. So. I started, I knew the story was coming out on a Wednesday. So I told a few friends. I, I called my closest friend in town. And uh, I said, uh, this story uh, will be, and he said, hi, so you're going to ESPN. I go, he said, it's on Twitter. So my, my hiatus and my return both were broken on Twitter. Um, but anyway, finally got announced, and I think you know the rest of the story. I'll, I'll speed up this uh, proceeding. But it was, it was fascinating, though, to then to start to talk about it, to then to meet people. I mean, I've done a radio show for many, many years. You, you, you have a connection to an audience. It's, it's fascinating to, when I would, I would go to a gas station during this period, I, I was in there, I, was, I mean, I was pumping gas. This man walked over and hugged me. He said, I've missed you so much. We have a... <laughs> We have a woman who calls in our show, whose name is Tammy. Anybody ever heard of her? She's an Auburn fan. She, uh, she announced her wedding a couple of months ago on the show to an Alabama fan. Um, she took a second job during the, the hiatus, and she told USA Today, uh, who did a story on our return, that she had to do something in the afternoon since she couldn't call in the show and couldn't listen. So, I mean, there is this connection, and you know, it, it's through various mediums, um, but, it, but it does tie back to, uh, to social media. I was asked the other day, you know, what, and I know Gracie probably talked about it last night, um, but you know, what, it, was there a specific social media plan when you went to work at ESPN? Right? There was, wasn't there? Um, a lot of, at ESPN, they, they, you know, everyone is somewhat on their own individually. Uh, and, and I felt like once I started working on game day that there would be a way to connect every week. I, I'd go to a campus, uh, I would talk about the students that I ran into or would, would interact with. And one thing that, uh, that I got to do is being the, the, the newest person on game day is Sports Center leads into game day at 9 o'clock Eastern. But there, there's, uh, so they wanted me for Sports Center, but they didn't want me at 8.40. Easter, and that's when the stars of game day were on. They wanted me at 7.40 Eastern time, when Herb Street was still waking up. <laughs> <laughs> so I would often uh, get up at 3.30 in the morning and be on the first van to campus to, uh, to get there. But I also, uh, I mean, there was some good and bad. I would, I would go with two other members of game day. David Pollack, which is no big thrill to see him at 5.30 in the morning, but the other person was Samantha Steele, who was at least engaging at that hour. Um, <laughs> although, and this is completely off the record, I mean, I'm the first one out there. I mean, I, I'm out at 7.40. Sam and Pollack were at 8. Who do you think got in the makeup chair first every... Sam Steele. Sam Ponder, I'm sorry. 
So I always tweeted, hey, I just went out and did Sports Center. The folks in Athens are riled up today, the folks in Southern Cal. But the most interesting experience I had all year was we were in Seattle uh, about five weeks into the season at the University of Washington. They were playing, I think, Oregon or somebody. And 5.30 in the, 5.30, 5.40 in the morning Pacific time. We got to campus about 3.30 Pacific. And there were students, you know, there were 15, 20, uh, game day had never been to Washington. There were 15 or 20,000 students already there. And I, and I go out for my hit, and I'm, I mean, they, they are just, it's raining, and they are just buzzed. I mean, just, they were literally were buzzed. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, I took a, I took, a, I took a deep breath for a second, and it, it, I thought I was back at the University of Tennessee, back in my college days. It was so, it was so, it was so cool. Sorry, Dean. Um, um, game day was, usually you end your career doing something like game day. I started my career at ESPN doing game day, and it was, I mean, if, it, if, I, if I ever top it, I'll be thrilled, because it, it was such an amazing experience. You walk in a room for the first time, you're scared to death, even at a late point in life. And there's Lee Corso and Desmond Howard and Herb Street. And, you, and then the, the second week, they put me on a panel with all of them. I'm like going, I mean, did I win like the American Idol version of game day? Like I get my one week <laughs> and then I have to go back to, uh, to, to Iowa or someplace. But it was... Uh, uh, about six weeks into it, I get, I, I get uh, it's the Northwestern Ohio State game. Hard to believe Northwestern was the host of game day. So, well, I, get, I, I, I do work for a living. I do have a radio show. And unlike, you know, the stars of the game day who get on site, get to play golf. And I mean, I, so I got caught a flight out of North Carolina, got to Chicago, got to the hotel. And it's about 11.45 on Friday night. And there's these five drunk Ohio State fans. Not that I've seen that many sober Ohio State fans. <laughs> and, and they're all like looking at me. And they, they clearly don't know. I mean, they don't know me. I mean, I'm, I've only been on the show for five weeks. And one's like, you're... Uh, 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 yeah, and one, one finally brought you. You're the you're the new guy on game day. Couldn't tell my name, but I'm trying to think. You know, this is really pretty cool. Um, <laughs> here's a guy who's in his late fifties after thirty five years in the wilderness. I'm now being recognized by drunks <laughs> in Skokie, Illinois. And it was. Amazing to be an overnight sensation. And I thought my career was headed toward this am am just amazing ascent, and then finally it all came crashing down. In December, at the SEC championship game, game day was supposed to be in Atlanta, and then some guy had a, another idea, some player for Auburn took a missed field goal 109 yards back and <laughs> sent game day to Indianapolis. But because of my connection to the SEC, they sent me to Atlanta. So I go, and, and Gracie's been at game day. And when you're on game day, they, they, on the first week, they get what kind of Starbucks you want. And you get that all the way through the Rose Bowl and through the chain. They, they get your lunch order. There are people that drive you. There are people that take you to the airport. They pack your, you don't even, I mean, you, you don't even have to wash your hands. They do that for you. <laughs> so I go through the 14 weeks of being a king. In Atlanta, I get up. I have to find a cab to the Georgia Dome. It's 20 degrees. I have to walk a mile and a half around the Georgia Dome trying to find out. I don't have my makeup person. I'm in the bathroom at the Georgia Dome putting on my own makeup. I know that sounds trite for most people, but you get used to these things. <laughs> I don't have a field of producers. I mean, there's hundreds of people in game. 
I walk out, and there's this crew who obviously was hired for, for, this, one, for this day, and they go, uh, I said, well, are we ready to go? go I don't know. <laughs> All right, where's my sound guy? Where's my, I have to put my own sound on. So anyway, I'm out there about to do a hit on, on Game Day. There's two million people watching. And guess what happens? It's seven, it's about eight o'clock now, nine o'clock, whatever time it was. The Missouri band decides to start rehearsing on the field. Boom, uh, <laughs> you, you know what it sounds like. And I, I wanted to say like, hey, hey guys, game day. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cared? <laughs> so they come to me and uh, Chris Fowler and Herb Street and Desmond and Corso are in Indianapolis. So they go to me and Fowler asked me something about the game and I couldn't hear. But, you know, they're playing the Missouri fight song. So I put my hand over my ear. I mean, you always see, you know, live from, and I, I still couldn't hear. So I, I went from this to that to this. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Chris, uh, Auburn's got a real challenge today, getting the BCA, blah, 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 blah. They finally cut the thing. I couldn't hear him. He couldn't hear me. And the segment ends. And, I mean, I was devastated. I mean, I had really had an amazing run. I'd, I'd gotten in trouble early on game day. We were in Athens uh, uh, in the final uh, Saturday in September. They asked me to do a piece on Southern Cal. And I said, Chris, I don't know where this program's going. After all, Lane Kiffin is the Miley Cyrus of college football. <laughs> I said, he's an absolute joke. I said, I, said, I, I said, hopefully he'll be fired at the end of the season, and when Southern Cal decides to replace him, they at least hire an adult the next time. That was at 10.30 Saturday morning. I fly back to Birmingham after the show. You know, I go to bed. I, I wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, it's been a long run, and I was going to not really do anything. I check my phone and there's nine messages from ESPN. I'm like, oh, I'm, I, I didn't even, I just like grab, I, I flipped on the television, it says breaking news, Lane Kiffin fired at Southern Cal. I'm like going, wow. And then they show me on camera, Lane Kiffin is the Miley Cyrus of college football. <laughs> I'm like going, I got Lane Kiffin fired. I mean, I, as a Tennessee graduate, I have just, I have just earned an Accomplished Alumni Award. <laughs> I mean, I can't wait. So that's great. I mean, I'm thrilled. I'll get back to the game day story in a second. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I, mean, I don't know if I was thrilled. I mean, you don't really want to get somebody fired, with one exception, Lane Kiffin. Um, so two weeks later, I'm, I'm, back, I'm, I'm in Seattle for this game day, and I walk in. And guess who's sitting there at the game day table? Lane Kiffin. He was giving his first interview. So I had to walk over to him and say, well, hey, Lane. Um. <laughs> well, the funniest thing was, we actually hit it off. So the next day, he sends me a text and says, hey, uh, really great to meet you yesterday in Seattle. I'm sitting here listening to Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. <laughs> So I turned him on to Miley Cyrus. Poor thing. Well, anyway, back to Atlanta. Finger in the ear. I, I mean, I'm I mean, listen, there's a high and a low in everything we do, whether it's writing a, a, a paper, whether it's blogging. But there's really an amazing, when, when, when you're doing this show, I mean, it, there's, it, there's a slippery slope. I mean, you know, there aren't many things you can do in life with the, and have two million people watch. So I, mean, I exhale. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, if there weren't people around, I think I would have just gone outside and cried. I was that devastated by my failure on game day. So I, I sit down, I call my wife, and she's laughing. I'm like going, I mean, I, I mean it's one thing to be, <laughs> I mean, there's some cruel women in the world, <laughs> but laughing at your husband making him fool out of himself on national television, I mean, I don't, I mean, usually these type of people are serial killers. She said, that was the funniest thing I've ever seen. 
I said, what was the funniest thing? She said, the thing in the ear. She said, you didn't see it? I go, no, I didn't. I mean, I didn't even have a monitor. I mean, I'm working for ESPN. I don't even have a monitor. What happened was, if any of you saw it, so I, I do this thing, uh, I end the report, uh, and Chris, you know, I, I think if Auburn uh, wins today, I think they can get to the BCS. So they go back to Fowler, Herb Street, the whole guy. All four of them have their finger in their ear. <laughs> and then you know, Desmond Howard does this, and Herb Street goes, no, Des, I think Paul was like more like that. <laughs> it ended up, guess where? on Twitter, then it, was, it was retweeted eight zillion times, and the next week I'm in New York walking down Fifth Avenue. And you know, I may be recognized in Birmingham or Knoxville, but I'm in New York. I'm walking, a guy across the street goes, hey man. <laughs> I'm in LA a couple weeks later. Guy behind, TSA guy at LAX. I swear I, I kept thinking Obama was gonna do it. Just, but, um, The other project that I, I, I've been working on, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, was, the, was this book. Um, I always wanted to write a, a real book, not you know, a joke book or a gimmick book or a book of columns. And working with uh, Gene Wojciechowski was interesting. We knew each other in college, and we'd seen each other over the years, and this book brought us back together every week. The name of the book, in case you, you need to go out and buy it today on Amazon, is uh, My Conference Can, Can Beat Your, Your Conference why the SEC still rules college football. We, we stuck the still in there, the, still, still, S-T-I-L. We, we put that in there the night Auburn lost the national championship, just in case anybody thought we were backing away from our bravado. No, we're not. Actually, thinking about getting that uh, book out in time for Monday night at Florida plays Kentucky uh, in Dallas. But, but through, this, through the book project, um, and by the way, uh, I don't know if any of you ever met Gene Wojciechowski, but try spelling that on deadline without a spell checker. <laughs> to this day, with a million dollars on the line, I don't think I could spell his name correctly. <laughs> but we started uh, thinking about what to put in the book and how to relate not only the importance of the SEC, but take a trail through my career. And we, 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 used, it, we used game day as the narrative every week. And we went back and used the site of game day and then started introducing some of the uh, characters on our radio show. And, and our show is famous for usually bad things. But, but there are some interesting things uh, along the way. And, and one of them, one of, one of the stories is actually has to do with today. We have a young man named uh, Jonathan who, uh, who lives in Tallahassee. I met him this year. And he, he started tweeting last night or yesterday to, to win a seat at this luncheon. He tweeted so many times, somehow he won the seat. Now, he lives in Tallahassee, and I got, uh, uh, John, uh, Jonathan, is, is, he's, he's in his early 30s and has a couple of challenges. Um, but he, so once he, he won the ticket here today, he sent me a, a, t a note today asking me if I could send a plane for him. <laughs> if I could, I would have. Um, but speaking of sending a plane for someone, about four years ago, right after we went on Sirius XM, we started getting a call from a young man in uh, Iowa uh, named Robert, Robert Fisher is his name. He's, 30, he, he was, he's 34 now, he's in a wheelchair, and he has cerebral palsy. And he began calling in, and one day he invited us to come to the, he said, well, we, 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 I want you to come see me in Iowa. Now, I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, 1,450 miles. And he kept pushing me, and we had a, a doctor in our studio one day who has a private plane, and he looked at me and says, why don't we go? I said, okay. It's not like I'm paying for it. Um, so we decided, okay, we're going to take a caller or two from the show. So we started debating uh, who are the famous callers. It came down between two people. Tammy, I mentioned her, the screaming Auburn fan, and another guy named Legend. Now, Legend's backstory is this. He's in his early, late 40s, early 50s now. At 17, Legend shot a man six times in cold blood. He claimed it was a family issue that the guy had, I don't, who knows. He went to jail, to say the least. He got out, and 
Yeah, I'm not sure about the Alabama parole codes, but obviously shooting someone six times in cold blood does not qualify for life imprisonment in Alabama. You, if, you, if you yell roll tight enough, you will get out of jail. <laughs> and uh, he got out and became a famous caller to our show. Calls in every day and talks about his experiences, the redemption. Anyway, I, I thought Legend would be a great caller. Uh, he would be great to take with him, but I wasn't sure the, the extradition laws of Iowa, so we decided to take Tammy. So we, we had this amazing visit with Robert, and then he gets invited back by, by an Alabama fan the next year, so he goes to the Alabama Ole Miss game. Here's this young man in a wheelchair, and his father's an ex-Marine, worked at the John Deere plant, just a hard-boiled guy, and he told me that Robert used to, used to be embarrassing because his son couldn't do what everyone else on the block did. Um, so this day in Tuscaloosa, we're all standing there, and there are a hundred people lined up at the Alabama Ole Miss game in Tuscaloosa to get their picture made with Robert. And his father looked back toward me and he said, this is the proudest day of my life. It was just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And, and so for all the bad of, of what some of us do, not, not all of us, uh, this is one of those days where you say to yourself, it, it's almost worth it, that you could, you could have that kind of impact. We had a, another caller named Smokey who called us once from an ER. I said, what are you doing in the ER? He said, I'm having a heart attack. I said, you're having a heart attack? He said, yeah, Paul, I'm going to die, and I just wanted to tell you I loved you. Well, fortunately, Smokey lived to call in again. We had another man call in, a surgeon, who was, who was actually removing someone's gallbladder while he called. We don't know whether his patient survived or not. <laughs> and then in January of 2011, guess what happened? A guy named Alpham Dadeville called in and told me that he had just poisoned the iconic tumors trees on the Auburn campus. These, are, these trees have been there 115 years. Auburn fans, I mean, I mean they get emotional just thinking about them, and, and he poisoned them. And uh, I asked him uh, if poisoning trees, if that was against the law, and he responded, what do I care, roll damn tide. A few weeks later, we learned that uh, Homeland Security was investigating. We, we laughed it off. I mean, I, I told the class earlier, I didn't take it seriously. We laughed it off. Uh, finally, uh, they, were, they, they, they thought that he had uh, poisoned the water system, which was an act of terrorism, and uh, it made CNN and uh, NBC and became the most famous call and talk radio history. And the 62-year-old Updike, uh, who has a collection of 100 Alabama hats, you could say he was obsessed with Alabama. He poisoned the tree because he felt like his school had been disrespected because an Alabama, because an Auburn fan had, uh, had, had draped the Bear Bryant statue at, at Bryant Denny Stadium with a Cam Newton jersey four years ago during, during all that. Well, he has 100 Alabama hats. He named his oldest son Bear Bryant. He named his daughter Crimson Tide, T-Y-D-E, and got into a ferocious argument with his wife and finally lost the argument because he wanted to name his second daughter, Allie, A-L-L-Y dash Bama, Allie Bama. He did win the battle to name his dog Nick Saban, but he lost the war to stay out of jail. Uh, he spent three months in the penitentiary in Lee County, Alabama. If you've ever been there, that's not a place you'd like to spend too much time behind bars. He did when I, uh, I, I visited him on his final day in jail. He told me that he sold his autograph in jail. He, he would sign other prisoners' uh, orange jumpsuits, roll damn tied, and in return, uh, he would, uh, this is no joke, he would receive honey buns, the sweet pastry. That was apparent in southern prisons. That's apparently very important currency. <laughs> I could go on all day. You ever heard that before? But I won't. Um, I think we'll have a little time, hopefully at the end, to answer some questions. But I, I did want to thank 
Dean Worth very much for inviting me and, and the staff uh, and especially Patrick Powell who's in the back for starting this incredible journey that uh, has uh, gotten me to speak in front of you today. In, in terms of estrangement, the separation between Tennessee and myself has never received uh, very much notoriety. In, in fact, I don't think anyone even noticed it until RJ's piece today in the Daily Beacon. Uh, the antithesis of this may be Pat Conroy, the, the great novelist uh, in South Carolina, who, whose work include The Prince of Tides and The Great Santini. Uh, he had a falling out with his school, The Citadel, over one of his books. And after about 30 years, both the author and the school, like often is the case, they forgot why they were mad at each other. And he was invited back to speak at the commencement. And in the commencement address, he, uh, he told the story of uh, the book that got him in trouble, The Lords of Discipline. And he talked about writing in the book a phrase, I wear this ring. The ring at the Citadel, like so many other schools, is the, com is the common bond. He talked about a friend lost in Vietnam. And he made sure that when that friend, one of his buddies, during the war was sent back in a coffin, he put his citadel ring on him because it was the bond. And then he did something very odd at the end of the speech. He invited the class to his funeral. He said, and I quote, I'm going to tell you how to get to my funeral. He says, you walk up, you find the usher waiting outside, and here's your ticket. You put your citadel ring in front of him, let him check for the year 2001. In each one of you, I want you to say this before you enter the church at which I'm going to be buried. You tell them, I wear this ring. I think about that as I look at my hand today. I had a class ring at one point I proudly wore. And through the vagaries of life, it disappeared. But, but today, I, I feel compelled to order another one. I, uh, I may be the oldest person in history to ever call the ring company, <laughs> but, I, but before I go to bed tonight, I'm going to order a class ring, and that deed will be done. This has been really special for me, uh, meeting so many wonderful faculty, and I had such a blast talking to students this morning. And it may sound cliche, but, but for me, in, in so many respects, the circle has been complete. I hope it's a new beginning. And I think back uh, to that day, a day much like today, an idyllic April spring day, when I first walked into the Daily Beacon. I had nothing, no future, and really not much hope. I couldn't even type. But this university, and particularly this, this department, helped open a very, very important door. I, I thank all of you for making me feel welcome, and it's great to be home again. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. 
with um, you know more than 150,000 followers on Twitter, how much do you have to censor yourself or stop before you type those 140 characters about what you're going to say? I just remember a few months ago when Cleveland was going through the thing with the coach and things like that, somebody who I follow who's a great uh, sports columnist just started firing one-liners and stuff, a lot of rat a tat a tat a tat So what's your process to censor yourself? Well, a, a Twitter philosophy is, all, is something that's always evolving. I, I I don't mean this to sound wrong, but I don't do a lot of engaging because when, when you are polarizing, you know, it, it could end up being very personal. So I, I but I, I do, I find Twitter to be a challenge in many respects. I remember sitting one Friday night, I think Louisville was playing in a game uh, and they lost to, uh, I think it was US, US, USF. And I, I had joked, I, I joked on Twitter, I said, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad uh, everyone agrees that Louisville should be in the BCS championship game. I mean, it's a joke. It's obvious. I, I must have gotten 50 people go, you're an idiot. Aren't you watching this game? I'm like going. And I, and I realized that if you're, if, you, if you're too cynical on Twitter, it will fail. So I, I'm careful. Um, but that's who I am, though, is kind of the double entendre. So I, I, I try to, to be careful. I would say I'm not nearly as caustic as I would like to be. Uh, and some of that comes from the number of people who, who pay attention to this stuff, and it also comes from the responsibility when you work at a company as great as ESPN and Disney. You, you have to always be cognizant that, you know, if you're some guy in Fort Sanders in your basement, you know, tweeting that, you know, some terrorist-type terrorist stuff, you probably are going to get away with it. You're not going to get away with it if you're in the media. And uh, I'm not willing to uh, endanger what I'm doing to be clever on Twitter. I mean, I did uh, two years ago when Alabama was on a roll. I, I, I tweeted right before the Super Bowl. I said, uh, and, and my Super Bowl pick is uh, Alabama by seven over the 49ers. I mean, it, it must have been retweeted 5,000 times because Alabama fans actually believed it. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, it's always a balance, and, I, and I'm not trying to just give you boilerplate, but like I said earlier, I mean, you, you do not blow your entire career to be funny on Twitter. It's not worth it. Uh, now, now, some, I mean, I, I, I'm, it's, always wor it's always evolving. Um, I, I pulled back somewhat because I'm, I'm about to, you know, be involved with the an entity that involves 14 SEC schools, so you, I'm probably not as quick to uh, fire a coach as I used to be. <laughs> I mean, I said something about Derek Dooley that, uh, I mean, it was really, it was fairly, really vile, really, and not vile in, in a, but vile in the sense of, you know, the guy can't coach. Um, and, you know, where today, I'm, I'm more careful. That doesn't mean you can't give strong opinions. That doesn't mean you can't say what you mean, but just be careful how you say it. Um, so in my sports class today, you said that um, one of the things, one of the people you look to in radio is how it's What a loaded question. Um, well, I've changed sports journalism for many, for the good. Um, <laughs> what I did, where, where I made the most impact, I'll try to, is that I was the first person in Alabama to ever write objective commentary on sports. It, it had been a place that, you know, you had the greatest coach of, in college football history, other than Phil Fulmer, um, for so long, and nobody had ever done it. And I was a young guy, and I didn't care. I mean, I was reckless in my approach that I'm not going to be here very long. I don't have a family. I don't have any responsibility. So I'm just going to. I mean, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't violating any principles of journalism. I was just just bold. 
and it it was difficult but I also didn't have the concerns that most people have and what happened was it it took a long time people didn't get it but they finally did and it began to change the culture it, it would have eventually changed anyway uh, so I think that's probably where I had the most impact back then what I think I have the most impact now is that we have in terms of talk radio probably on, on, on a broad scale the most unique show where it's a caller driven show not a host driven show um, I'm a big believer in this we have we probably have 10 or 20 or 30 callers who, who literally believe the show might not be on without them um, is that good? Well, it helped create the Harvey Updikes. I mean, a lot of people blame me. They say, well, it's because of you. It's because of the, 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 what you did on that show. You, you, you start, I, don't, I, I will not take that responsibility. We, create, we have a forum. Uh, if someone wants to call in and scream and holler, good. Uh, people tend to like it. Well, I mean, you know, people say, well, you're the, the Jerry Springer. Uh, well, so what? I mean, the guys, I'm not trying to be a capitalist here, but I mean, the guys may billions of dollars having a show where, where people from Ohio and Pennsylvania throw, throw folding chairs at each other. Um, what's the most successful sport in the world? Is it the NFL or is it the WWE? Um, I'm not, I don't want to say too much about this in a place like this after what I've just got through saying, but my belief is it's not necessarily P.T. Barnum who you say would give, give the people what they want, but I mean, let the people decide. Uh, and at some point, uh, you, know, you start hurting, hurting the cats a little bit. Um, but but I, I'm, I'm a big believer that someone has a right to call in. And I think when you do that, and this is the most important point, the audience feels connected. The audience doesn't feel like they're being talked down to. Howard Stern relates to mil millionaires on Long Island and truck drivers in Jersey. Because you know, even though he makes $30 million a year, even though he lives in a... $30 million mansion, he connects. People don't say, well, you know, that guy, that guy, he's not one of us. And he is one of us because he's, I mean, first of all, he's talking about what people are interested in. Um, that's what we do on, on the sports realm. It's, it's, it's a little unorthodox. I don't recommend it for everyone. But, and I'm not sure it's a path I want to continue taking. I mean, at some point, you do kind of outgrow it. And I've, I'm to the point where I would like to get a little more serious with what we do and maybe a little, may, maybe manage these, this insane asylum with a little more maturity. I mean, after all, I'm, I'm no longer living in a dorm room in the presidential complex. I mean, I, I am an adult, uh, but I don't approach it that way, though. Uh, I don't have a lot of friends who are coaches. I don't, uh, in spite of all the rumors, I, I don't have a guest room at Nick Saban's house. Uh, I've been there. Um, but if I never got invited back, that would be fine. Kind of going to the overall theme, you can't, uh, we were, Joe and I were talking earlier, you, you can't, in a town like Knoxville, in a town like Tuscaloosa, in Athens, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to get too far away from your audience because they will turn on you. And I, I always wondered, well, how would it work if I had worked in Knoxville? It would have worked great. I'd have been fired at 23 <laughs> and uh, probably would have made something of my career. Um, uh, instead, I, you know, wh why was I successful in, Bur in, in Birmingham? Does anyone know? I'll just throw this out, try to, try to be academic here. For me. There's a reason why I was, I was successful in, in Birmingham. I wasn't speaking to a fan base of only one school. I had two. And they hated each other. And they were always at, at, at each So you could go back and forth. Uh, and you could and you could moderate and and the callers did all the work where if you do it in a college town it will probably fail uh, and, and I applaud guys who have spent their entire careers uh, being able to navigate the waters because it's extremely difficult Uh, I was just wondering, how do you professionally or personally deal with like problems that you face, such as like, uh, regardless if it's like due to an environmental factor or technical problems, or like the example you gave earlier, you said you felt devastated, but besides just like you just kind of have to recruit. And yeah, it's a good question. Let, let me let me give you. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll become a professor here for five seconds. 
what, so what do we have on our program? We have a caller-driven show. We're the best-known caller-driven show in America. So in late November, the Alabama-Auburn game ends on a 109-yard. I mean, I'm, nobody's ever seen anything like this ever. Alabama's run over. So the executives at ESPN go, you know what? We've got the hottest caller base show in America. Let's do something unique. On the Monday after the game, let's put the radio show on television, on ESPNU. 84 million homes get ESPNU. And they come to me and they say, what do you want to do? I said, well, <laughs> it's obvious what I want to do. I don't want to talk to some blogger who was at the game. I mean, I want to talk to Tammy and Legend and Harvey Updike and all these crazy people. So they say, are you sure? I said, oh, yeah, I'm sure. I don't want any, I don't want any guests. I want callers. So, I mean, it's, it was a bit of a dry run for the, the, on, in the, on the SEC network, uh, which debuts, it, our, our show will be on for four hours. So this was a dry run. So show comes on. I don't need to be, do I need to be prepared for this show? I mean, I've waited my whole life for this day. And now here is Paul Feinbaum. And uh, hey, what, a, what an event, you know, we've, uh, Alabama done. Let's go to the first call. Hello, Paul. Hey, uh, hey John. Let's go to the second call. Guess what happened? Every Alabama and Auburn fan in America called in at the same moment, <laughs> and they blew out the phone lines. <laughs> Nearly three hours went by, and I'm talking to myself. Um, I mean, you know, I've never wanted to die <laughs> until now. And I'm, I'm like getting my, and by the way, I'm doing it in Charlotte. My producer is in Birmingham and Bristol. Nobody, I'm like, going, what's going on? I mean, I'm like, I mean, it's, it's like suddenly walking out on the street out there and realize you don't have any clothes on. I mean, I mean so it, it turned out to be a great example, a great, a, a great lesson for me. And boy, it's pretty easy to figure out what the lesson is. Be prepared. Um, we didn't have a backup plan. We had no, I mean, we just assumed it would be great. And it was, it was a nightmare. But, but I, I learned, uh, we did it again uh, the following Monday after uh, the SEC championship game, and we, we actually still had some phone problems, but uh, we were better prepared. So that's uh, kind of going to your question. You know, the game day thing, live television, you have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, in a live radio show, you can be a little better equipped to, uh, to deal with it. Great question, though. Thank you very much.